Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's in with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> is episode 30 and it is with at last Mr. Steve Everts and look I hope you're built of stern stuff because this episode <laughs> um some of Steve's stories are not for the faint hearted I mean after about an hour and a half when we finish right you'll you'll pick up your brew you, you might spit it out it's going to be cold because your ears are going to be glued to this episode it really is a belter um, so thanks for joining us and downloading. And I need to say an extra special thanks, right? Because this weekend we found out that because of you hitting subscribe and downloading, we have surpassed a hundred thousand downloads, um, which we are really chuffed with because we've been going less than a year. And of course, there's other podcasts out there that get much more than us. That's, you know, dip in the ocean. But we're really, really thrilled the fact that we've made such an impact and we've got a lovely, uh, loyal family and, and listenership. So thank you. All right. Thanks for telling your friends and all that. It, it does mean a big deal. And also a huge thank you to everybody that turned out last week on a, a very miserable, rainy night in Liverpool at the Baltic Social for the first ever live two-shot podcast. Uh, what a great night. We were joined by our kid, who opened and warmed everybody up with some fantastic, funny and moving poetry. Uh, and everybody had a little break, we had a drink, and then Ingrid Oliver came to join us. And we had a right good natter. I'll be honest, I was cautious, nervous bit of both. I was worried that with an audience there, are we going to lose the intimacy of what we have and what we've created on the podcast? It turns out, yes, dynamics did change, but it was only for the better. We still had those brilliant moments of intimacy um, because the audience were there. Sometimes they were, they were very quiet and listening and sometimes they were joining in. It, it was great. It was a brilliant, brilliant night. And I spoke to a few of you afterwards there was a couple who I spoke to, and I don't want to be rude, I don't want to say elderly, they were older, and they told me they'd never listened to the podcast or heard about it. It was their son-in-law that told them to come down, and they said that they'd had the best night. So for me, that really is the best review um, so again, thank you so much for everybody. And we are going to do some more. You may have heard that we have been announced. We are on the lineup for Kendall calling this year, which is one of my favorite festivals. And we're going to be at my favorite place, which is Tim Peaks Diner. For those of you who have been to Kendall before, you know, it's a beautiful, intimate festival full of brilliant people and great acts. Well, that's where we'll be at the end of July. So if you've got tickets, fantastic. If you haven't, I'm pretty sure it's close to selling out. It always does very quickly. So if there's a couple, uh, a couple of tickets floating around, pick them up quick. It's it, it's always a great weekend, and we are thrilled and honoured uh, to be on that lineup this year. Uh, what else? Oh right, so yeah, so people do get in touch via social media and email and we always try and get back to everybody and one such person that's got in touch and asked for a little shout out is somebody that's been a supporter of the podcast since we started it's lauren nicole mays she is doing a play with emily curtis at manchester's 53-2 venue now that is on 8 albion street the play is called eggs it's written by florence keith roach 
Chantelle Walker is directing. Now, if you're in Manchester between the 7th to the 10th of March, it's going to be on at 7.30. Why don't you grab yourself a ticket from 532.com forward slash eggs and go and support a fellow Two Shot Pod family member. Always a good thing. Eggs, the play, go check it out. She hasn't told me what it's about. I don't know, so I can't tell you. But I bet it'll be good. Get yourself over to 53.2 Venue. Right, enough of all my waffle, and let's get on to somebody else who loves Anatta. It's episode 30 with the fabulous Mr. Steve Everts. Enjoy, and I shall see you at the end. <laughs> I do love being back in Manchester, though. It's all right, isn't it? Yeah. How long have you lived here, then, Steve? Well, I'm all my life. Are you born and bred? Well, I'm Salford, really. I was born in Manchester in the hospital, but we lived in Salford. Very different distinction, there. Very, very much. There's <laughs> a different world down there, man. Uh, I'm a Salford lad, anyway. I just kind of slowly moved out, not with any kind of plan. I had shitty flats in Crumpsall after I got kicked out of the Navy and all this business. And it just slowly went from Crumpsall to Presswich, to Whitefield. And I've been in Whitefield now since about 95. Happy there? Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love the place. It's good. Mm. So tell me about school, Steve. School. Are we rolling now? Yeah. All oh, right, yeah. Um, Roman Catholic. Yeah. So it's like... Where, whereabouts were you? We were in Salford. We had St Albert's, a place called... Uh, primary school, uh, sorry, secondary school. Mm. Was St Albert's, we're like an Irish Catholic family. Six of us. <laughs> six of yeah. us? Six of us, yeah. Mum and Dad still were they together? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mum yeah. and Dad together, yeah. Mum and Dad, Irish immigrants, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Our grafters. Um, yeah, stayed together, six of us. The old fella's no longer with us. The, my mum is. Uh, but that was it. We were basic, basically an Irish Catholic family. So it was like he grafted, my mum grafted. She was like, used to clean the school I went to. She was, I don't know how she did it, you know. She'd be up at like uh, five in the morning and walk to the school where I did, clean it, come back and get us ready to go to school, <laughs> feed us, make sure we got out and we were dressed all right. And then she'd go back in when school finished to clean it again and then come back and do our tea. The old fella, he was, he, when he come in, you know, it was just a typical Irish Catholic family. Yeah. Two sets of twins in it. Um, I've got three sisters. Well, I had three sisters. Two other brothers. Frog marched down to to Sunday at church every Sunday. Until I discovered that was a load of bollocks. Were they, were they still quite religious, your mum and dad? Yeah, in their own sort of hypocritical way. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, not, I don't mean that in a nasty way. No. Um, it was just what what they did, and it was how we were brought up. And you know, the priest used to come round for a cup of tea, and the TV would go off, and he always had this doom and gloom, and these pictures on the wall of guilt and suffering, and it never, it never quite sat right with me. <coughs> but, was uh, the area quite a, 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 an Irish Catholic area that you no, were in? No, not or? necessarily. No, we were first. My earliest life, I remember, was in Salford round Silk Street in the council flats there. <laughs> I mean, it was all right. There were new council flats, and we got housed there. It was just, it just was a rough area, really. And I remember once my old fella getting somebody got tied up and put in the doorway. And when when the door was open, there was some lad tied up, and the old fella went out to have a look what happened. And uh, a couple of blokes set on him and give him an hiding or something. So. But anyway, it was kind of that that spurred him on to uh, buy his own house, which I think was a great, great move for him. Because he used to be a... Um, he used to do whatever the Irish bloke did. He was a physical worker, but he actually bettered himself and became... I <laughs> say bettered himself, I don't mean that derogatory way. He worked his way up to what we call white-collar worker. He was a sales rep right. for the British gas. So I never really saw my old man in a pair of jeans... He went to, to work in a shirt and tie in his car and uh, done a lot of paperwork. And he just worked hard and he were good. We never went to bed hungry, you know, all the usual stuff. There was a lot of religious dogma. Um, but then they bought an house up in Salford, uh, Salford 7, up in Higher Broughton, 
which was quite good. It was they weren't um, it wasn't as rough as Silk Street, but it was still Salford. Yeah, um, and it was good. We had a good childhood there. And, and things was fine. Like I say, he used to get us up in the morning and Sunday morning, get down to church, get down to church. And I hated Sundays with a passion because you had to put your Sunday best on. My mum frog about, she was in bed smoking his cigars and reading the news of the bloody world, what <laughs> someone had to go out and get for him. I suppose it was his day off in a yeah. way. <clears throat> I bet he couldn't wait to get rid of us and have a bit of peace in the house. And I, I used to hate it. I used to come back and say, can I play out? No, why? Because you've got your Sunday best on. Can I get changed? No, why? Because it's Sunday. So you'd stay in it all day? Stay in it all day. Hey. Watch black and white films on the telly. It took me years to be able to watch one of my own accord. I had this, like, aversion therapy to black and white films on a Sunday afternoon. And, you know, people would knock on the door, is Steve playing out? No. Why? Because it's Sunday. I mean... <coughs> I was really envious of all my heathen mates outside <laughs> playing on bikes and getting climbing trees and stuff and I was sat in, you know, watching another black and white film. But then when when I left school, I ended up um joining the ships. I worked on freight ships. Can we just go back to school? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. What was what was school life like for you? It was alright, I enjoyed it, but to me, it was boring. It wasn't engaging enough. There was no drama at school. It was just going through the motions. All I did at school was go there, turn up, mess about with my mates, and go home. So not academic in any way, really? I was academic if I was interested in something enough. And I'd never been... Nothing really grabbed me. I did like um, English lit. I did like writing. But to this day, I still don't know... Um, uh, what a verb or an adverb or a noun or a pronoun is, but I kind of think I know how to use them subconsciously. So I did enjoy school, only because I had a lot of fun there. And you had uh, a lot of mates? I had a lot of mates there, yeah, and we got up to all sorts of... Uh, shenanigans. Shenanigans, <laughs> as, as you do. But there was, uh, there was this one teacher came in, uh, uh, English teacher, I was called Miss Miller. She was a student from, like, Northern Ireland... But she was doing English, and she incorporated a bit of drama into that. Did she? And I remember thinking that was great. And we did have some previous drama lesson, but when I think back now, the teacher was so lazy. She'd just sit there and say, you pretend you're stuck in, in, in a marsh. Pretend you're stuck in quagmire. And we'd all be on the clock going... Nah. And she'd be reading the paper or something. Was she? So it wasn't really... It was kind of like, what can I give these dickheads something to do for an hour <laughs> while, I, while I can read, like, take a break or the equivalent of it at the time? Well, this Miss Miller came in and she was great. She put us in groups and said, you know, make sketches up and do that. <clears throat> and we did. So she, she was encouraging the creativity? She was very, very encouraging creativity. She was like, it doesn't matter what you're doing, just get together. And me and these other lads, we got together and we'd done... Um, a little comedy sketch about uh, robbing a bank. And it was, it was that... Well, we were pleased with it, and she was. You know, you go in the bank, and we're about to rob the bank, and the guy go, get in line, please. And there'd be some woman driving me, oh, come on, we're here to rob the bank. Sorry, it's dinner time now. <laughs> Can you come back in an hour? And we'd be waiting outside, and then we'd come back an hour. And it was just a stupid kid sketch. How old were you then when you were doing that? That we were about... I would have been about... 11 or 12. That's a good sketch. That's a good little well, sketch. Well, she made us put it on in the school assembly. Did she? She made us put it on and we couldn't believe... She wanted to see us after the lesson. And we were like, oh, shit, what have we done wrong? <laughs> and she said, you know, that was good. Uh, do you mind doing it in front of the school? And was like, what? And it really was just a basic kids thing. But it, it was quite funny. And we did it in front of the assembly, I think, the next day after prayers and I just remember people laughing and people clapping what did you feel when when, when they started to laugh it's like I found something that but wasn't quite sure what it was yeah but again there was no there was no encouragement in the respect that it would have been a viable way to earn a living when you grew up our school wasn't that way inclined well if it was I certainly didn't hear any of it 
There's like large factories near it, Warden Goldstones and Western Oils Fields. And we were like a conveyor belt for them. Mm. And uh, well, a lot of people think that, don't <coughs> they? They, they? They would, they would put on the television and go, well, I, I, yeah, I'd love to do that, but the, I don't think the likes of me would ever exactly. be, be on there doing that. Exactly. Yeah. It's like it wasn't allowed. And it, it was never... Nobody ever said, you know, you can, someone like you can earn a living doing that. Because everyone you saw on the telly was, uh, had different accents and spoke well. And they, they were on the telly, they were actors, they were famous people. We couldn't even begin to have the nerve to think of ourselves in that profession or in that box. Yeah. It was a non-entity. It was like somebody... Somebody would have said to me, you could be a brain surgeon. It was ludicrous. You can go to the it moon. Was, yeah, it yeah. was never picked up on. It was never encouraged. And the little signs were there for that, that I enjoyed it. I heard that applause. I did like it. I did get off on it. Did any of the <coughs> other teachers say anything to you um, when you'd finished that assembly? No. <clears throat> no, they didn't. Not even a well done around? Yeah, yeah, no, we got lots of that. Yeah. We got lots of well done. That was great. Really good. Blah, blah, blah. And me and the other two kids who wrote it, we didn't know what we'd done that was right. We knew we had a laugh doing it. We used our imagination. We did get encouraged. But it was never, it was never built upon. And it still wasn't built upon. Nobody ever said that could be an option. Have you thought about going to college to do it? Have you thought about this? Never ever did I hear anything like that. And again, from, from where I was from and what I did, going to college wasn't an option or uni. It was always like, get a job when you leave. My old father was just get a job, get a job. You know, uh, my mum, get a job. Because that's what I did and that's, yeah, what, yeah, that's, that's what, what you do. You that's just what get a you job. do. Get a job. Have you started looking for a job yet? You're going to be leaving school soon. Have you started get Not having a clue what I wanted to do. And then one day, it was the last day at school, we're all leaving, you know, people come in, they start smoking in the playground. So what, you're now 15? I, I'm 15 now, yeah. yeah. And I'm leaving, I'm, I'm 16 the week after we leave. So, yeah, I'm leaving school at 15. This guy comes in from the Merchant Navy to show us a film to keep us uh, distracted, to stop us being distracted. It's like, this guy's got a film here, all messing around with it. He puts this film on, on the telly. <laughs> and it's like this young lad sailing around the world. He's not got a uniform on. He's not saluting anyone. He's in, like, India. He's in San Francisco. He's painting the ship. I thought, I'll have some of that. Did this, yeah. I thought, I'll have some of that. This is the last day at school. And when the guy finished the thing, everyone piled out. I went straight up to him and went, where do I go for this? And he said, you need to go down to the docks in Salford, the uh, Shipping Federation, there's a block, give me the address. He said, you need to go down there and register. Now, instead of getting the bus home that night, I got the bus the other way, the number one bus, down to Salford docks, found it, Shipping Federation, Merchant Navy, blah, blah, blah. Little block, he's been near the docks. I went in, I was 15, and I went up to the guy and I went, how do I join? He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 15. He said, well, come back when you're 16. I said, I'm 16 next week. He went, well, fucking come back next week then. <laughs> I was like, what? That's what he said to me. Well, fucking come back next week then. So I was like, right, I will. <laughs> I came back on my 16th birthday. Did he discuss anything with you, with your dad or anything about it? What yeah, said I wanted to go on. What did he say? He was just like, get a job, as long as you get a job. He didn't know, he didn't take it in, like, what, you're working in the docks? No, I'm going to try and join the Merchant Navy. What was the Merchant Navy? It's freight ships, I'm working on freight ships for Mercantile Marine. No, but just get a job. Right. Get a job. Anyway, I went back down on my 16th birthday, same guy, I... Uh, I'd like to join you again, he went, yeah. He said, right, fill this in, fill it all in. Fill all the details in, and he said, you'll have to do a written exam and have a medical. Right, great. So I got a letter coming for a medical. I was 16 now, fit as a fiddle. 
went in, passed the medical, well, they let me know, you've passed the medical. The, then I had to do a written exam, pissed it, it was quite easy, general knowledge questions and just anyone with half a brain could have answered. Done that, and then I got this thing about a month later, someone saying I've been accepted. However, I had to go down to Gravesend in Kent to join C School for three months. What was that? What did that entail? Three months entailed, yeah, getting your hair cut, putting a uniform on. It was me and these kids from all over England, same as me. Kids looking for a bit of adventure, not knowing what they wanted to do in life. There was Geordies, Scousers, Brummies. It was kids' mirror images of me from all over the country, and we bonded. Great. Anyway, we got to sea school, we were put into classes. Air shaving, yes, you will salute us off. They taught us things like rope work, how to splice nooses, this, that and the other. Uh, hitches, how to make knots. Wire work, putting a big eye on a cable. Uh, navigating, reading a compass. Uh, rope work, sailing a lifeboat, piloting the ship. All that kind of stuff. Are you enjoying it, Steve? I loved it. I didn't like the uniform bit of it, but what I liked about it, I was away from home, I met some great mates, we were all in the same boat, and it was a massive adventure, and we all knew we were going to be going on ships around the world when we came out. When you were doing, <coughs> sorry, when you were doing the sea school, where <coughs> were you when you were doing sea school? It was in a place called Gravesend, Kent. It was this big, just this big building. It had dormitories in it. So yeah. you were all there in the dorms all oh, together? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We all lived in the dorms. It had football fields at the back. It was right on the banks of the Thames. They had a lifeboat rig on the Thames that we could go in the lifeboat. Uh, they had shipping hatches from freight ships in the in the ground, in the playground, if you like. Yeah. The play. So you could open up hatches, metal hatches, and learn how to do that. Uh, and it was all that. For, for three months, it was learn all about the skills he needed to work on freight ships. And, you know, we were kids, we were all kids, some of us were fighting. If you got caught fighting, you got thrown out. Did anybody get caught? No, we all, there was a little, one or two little skirmishes went on, but everybody covered up for everyone. Right. Even, even so, you might have been fighting someone one minute, but for an officer come in, nothing happened. Exactly. None of us wanted to get kicked out. No. And it was just, just shenanigans of young lads, it was nothing serious. <laughs> and then when we, when we come, there was always other classes... Some were two weeks in front of you, the next class would come in two weeks behind you. Yeah. So there was a new influx every two weeks. So as that went on, we became the senior group, you know what I mean? Yeah. The ones in front of us, they left, we moved up here. So by the time we were all Dan's there, we'd been there two and a half months. We were like the bee's knees, if you like, and we watched all the peanuts coming in, as you used to call them. <laughs> and that's where they used to do, wind people up. Some terrible things like you get a new lad in the dorm and someone would go to him and say, hey, see him over there. Go, you want to see this photo of his bird tap dancing in the nude? Go and ask him, ask him. New lad, go, no, go and ask him. It's a laugh, he'll show you. The new lad would come up to someone and say, and again, this was acting. Have you got, what's that picture you've got of your girlfriend? And they go, you bastard. <laughs> You know, my girlfriend <laughs> lost both legs in an accident. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? There's all this kind of stuff going on. Um, but it was great. I did enjoy being at sea school, purely for the camaraderie. And I felt I was on at the beginning of an adventure. Mm. I knew I was like, going to get on a ship and I didn't know where. And then the last day of sea school, when it, right, you lot are leaving there. Everything you've taught here, forget it. It's all shit. That's what one of the officers said. And all the officers were old seamen. They all had a drink problem. Right. And there was a bar there, because the officers lived there as well. They used to be punching hell out of each other some nights, coming out of the bar. And we'd all get up and look out the window. See them giving it fisticuffs in the sort of the, the, the gap, the, what's it, the playground or something. And then the next day it'd be forgotten. You know, it, it was mad. You, but... We went in this lifeboat lesson. I'll never forget it. First lifeboat lesson. Like I say, all kids from all over the country, all a bit wild, all a bit cheeky, all gobby, know-it-alls, chucking paper at each other, yeah, this, that and the other. And this officer comes in, Mr McAllister, a massive guy. Beast of a man. 
and uh, we're all messing about while we're at school. I think this was on the second day. And he shouts, shut the fuck up. Well, that in itself, because no teacher said that, we all went a bit quiet and he said, right. He said, I'm going to turn me back for one minute. And in that minute, I want you to decide who's the two hardest bastards in here. He said, I'm going to take you both outside and I'm going to kick fuck out here. You've got one minute. And he turned his back and he was a hulking man. And he turned his back and we were all like, We all shit it. And he stood there for a minute. It's a hulking frame. And then he t- there's not a peep. And he turned around and he went, now we know who's in charge. And that was it. <laughs> it was like, what is this? This is not St. Albert. <laughs> this is not going to stand outside and see the headmaster. This guy this meant it. This is serious. It. This guy meant it. God. And you could see in his eyes he meant it. He was a raving lunatic. So we were all like, yes, sir. Right, you're going to learn how to attack a lifeboat. Any questions? No, sir. Right, you, here, now. What? This is the jib. Move the jib. Check the tack. He's made his point clear. He made his point. Yeah. Crystal clear. Bloody hell. And then uh, we left there. Left there. So is, this, is this the end of the three months now? Three months is over now, on the last day, the guy says, everything you've learned here, forget it, it's yeah. all bullshit. You'll learn when you get on the ships. And then he sent you home. And what the thing was then, you had to wait for a ship. My old man, get a job, get a job. I've got a job. I've got a job. <laughs> and during that three months when you were at sea school, you didn't, you didn't get home to see your mum and dad or your sisters? Oh, you yeah, did? I went home once. Only once for a long weekend. How was that, going uh, home? Yeah, it was fine. It was just different. It was, um, again, everybody in our area, what's it like? What's it like? And, you know, he had loads of tales to tell. And, but the old fella, he, he was like, he didn't seem to get it. Yeah, have you got a job yet? Oh, no, yeah, I've got a job yet. Yeah, well, how much money have you got coming in yet? We were on a retainer then when we were at sea school. It was nothing. Um, but to him, I didn't have a job because I wasn't getting up and going to work at yeah. nine and coming home at five, which is all he knew, really. And I couldn't get it through his head. And then, then I got, I got, I actually got a job while I was waiting for a ship. I got a job in Tay, took me to the job centre. Doing <laughs> what? The old fella took me to no, the job. What, were you, what job were it? <laughs> I worked in, sat in a clothing place. A little guy who, uh, which is near Piccadilly train station, not one of the clothing... They sold curtains. Right. It was just um, a material shop, really. I went, there was a thing in the job centre, looking for a boy to do this in the storeroom. My old man went, that'll do. I went, yeah, that'll do. To me, it was all short haul now. I was waiting for a ship and I'm gone. Yeah. And he took me down. My old fella drove me down. I went in, I had this interview with the guy who owned it. Basically, it was carrying stuff from there to there. Sweeping up, making a brew. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. He said, right, you can start now. Went back to the old fella, I've got a job. Right, so he drove home. So I had a job while I was waiting. For, and then that job finished, because he only had me short time. I got another job, still waiting for this elusive ship. How, how long's the gap now since you've finished sea school? It's probably about two and a half to three months now, and I'm getting itchy, itchy feet. Yeah, I bet. And I want to get out, and I want to go away. Then I got a job at Parker's, which was um, in Stretford. I don't know if they're Dutch bulbs... They imported uh, flowers and stuff like that. I worked there in the warehouse, packing up orders. <coughs> I was amazed how many people are into tulips and stuff. It's, big, to, it's big business. It, it's big business. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't understand it. But So, you know, you'd get a paper, for so many bulbs, this bulbs, that bulbs. Pack it up and send it out. I worked there. Um, and then I got a ship, I got a letter. Where were you going? Well, I didn't know where I was going yet. Oh, they don't tell you in the letter? No. They just said, uh, go and join this ship. It was a Manchester Crusade, if I'm not mistaken. Manchester liners, their container freight ships. Down at the docks, join it down at the docks, great. Pat me back, said goodbye to everyone. The old fella, he didn't even give me a lift down. I think I had to get a bus. <laughs> I got a bus and I turned up at the ship. Signed the article, so I was officially working on that ship. And I was a deck boy. Uh, somebody showed me my cabin. I still didn't know where I was going. 
and I was quiet as a mouse. I was just, I was just trying to figure it all out. And I was, I was basically, I was too nervous to say, where are we going? Yeah. Anyway, it's like someone said to me, we're sailing tomorrow. Where are we going? What? Where are we going? Uh, Montreal, Canada. So that was my first one. Freezing it was, it was in winter. <laughs> you know, I had visions of uh, being on a beach, like bikini-clad women uh, feeding me pina coladas. And next thing I'm on this ship, and it's like 20 below zero, and we're sailing up the St. Lawrence. And oh, man, it was cold, and I'm out on the deck with the ropes because you've got to tie the ship up and get it on tugs and stuff like that. And so were you was, doing all the very, very basic jobs? All yeah, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. when you're coming into port, you, you have to get the tugs on there, throw a rope up, you get it, you put a six-inch rope on, you tie it up, you make sure it's all right. You have to be on a winch, loosening it in case it gets too tight and it snaps. And no one to pull it in. Was there anybody on that boat from your sea school? Or? No, nobody. No, so you were sort I, of yeah, I make never, all sort of new pals? Yeah, I made, made new pals. There was, there was other lads... There's one or two other lads my age, but I was a deck boy guy. So you might get a lad in catering who'd probably be my age. He's just come out of whatever school. Well, they went to sea school as well. They'd done different things. So, and they'd be... There wouldn't be many our age. What they was, we were always usually gelled together, or youngsters. Mm. And then you had the old geezers. A lot of them liked to drink and was so... You know, it was a different world. If you had something on your mind, you spoke it, you, you said it to someone. Uh, if there was any any trouble, it got resolved pretty much immediately. And then it was forgotten about. Yeah. There was a good camaraderie of everybody on the ship because like, it, it was a sense of this, we're all in it together. But there was little factions between what we said, the old farts and us. It would have been young, wild, little feral. Yeah. We were feral, if you like. <clears throat> and we come from wearing these uniforms of an air court to when you got to port, you got some money and you went ashore. Nobody knew your mum. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> it, my mum, I, I swear she had this amazing spy network at home. You could, you could go... You could get a bus and go to Charlton and have a cigarette... And by the time you got home, she knew about it. It's like, crap, you've been smoking each other. What? She had this amazing spy network, and I never figured out. But when, when it, nobody knew her in Canada. But it was so cold that I ended up with six or seven trips on that ship. Uh, once we got stuck in the ice, the uh, icebreaker had to come out from Nova Scotia to, uh, to break us out. You know, it was like 20, 30 below zero. And you'd be out on the deck in the heavy weather gear and your nose would freeze up and there's blistering winds and, uh, you know. And I thought, I need somewhere warmer. So then I started looking for ships that went to warmer climbs. Oh, could you do that once you're on one? You could try and get on another? Well, well yeah, the way it worked was you only signed on a ship for basically uh, that trip, that journey, if you like. On, the, on that one, I was on it six times because... You signed on for three trips at a time. I'd done it twice. I was getting paid money. And although it wasn't a lot, the overtime was incredible. You were at sea. Like the guy goes, do you want to do overtime? Yeah, yeah, why not? <clears throat> so you're working all this overtime. And depending on what watch you were on, if you were on the 4 to 8 watch, then you worked 4 a.m. to late. You didn't, you just did look out then. So any other hours you did, apart from 4 to 8, were overtime hours. Right. So if you were on the 4 to 8, you'd officially supposed to be working at 4 o'clock, but it'd be light so you wouldn't need to, you just do lookout when you're on watch. And then at 8 a.m. and you start work, you're now on overtime yeah. until 4 o'clock again. <clears throat> 4 o'clock was a great watch. So there was loads and loads of overtime, and I was getting really good money for the time, for a young kid as well. And then going ashore and the old hands taking you to these really dodgy places... Uh, you know, it was great. It was great fun. Uh, how were you spending your money offshore? Or were you saving it? <coughs> I wasn't saving. Uh, I was sending money home. Are we are? I was sending money home. And I bet your dad were happy. My dad was happy. My mum was happy. I was sending her a keep home, if you like, even though I wasn't there. Yeah. And the way it worked at sea is you didn't have the money on you. 
everything was done like this, it was all signed for. You had your wages going in, you had a cruise bar, and all that was subsidised because we were in international waters. So it's like a pint of beer in a cruise bar. It was probably about four pence. And a lot of the guys, whiskies, I think it was 5p for a shot of whisky. So a lot of the old geezer in there slapping back the rum and the whiskey and all that. Uh, <coughs> so you just signed for what you had. Cigarettes was the bond, it was all bonded, so that was tax free. So at six, six o'clock every night, the chief steward opened the bond. Anybody want any back of your cigs? You go, you queue up, give us 200 cigs, sign for it. That's you with your fags done. When it came to going ashore, I was going in port tomorrow. If anybody wants any sub, write it down on this list. Yeah, I have hundred dollars signed me, and then you'd come round, he'd give you your money, and off you'd go ashore. Right, <coughs> and come back. And did it depend how long you were sort of offshore for, like in port for? Yeah, was it a few days or sometimes? Well, on the freight ships, it was a very quick turnaround. Uh, the container ship, sorry, because they were quick, pretty much on and off. You might be in a day and a half, two days. But I was on this other ship later on called the UK, which was an old bulk freight ship. And that would be in port for like weeks, a couple of weeks in India and stuff like that. So that was good. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of like my first real job, I suppose. Did you ever get homesick, Steve? I did at first. I did at first, but I just thought, you know, it's funny. It's funny when when I got home. Sometimes I just want to be away. If I was away, sometimes I want to be home. Yeah. But then then things started happening then because <coughs> my old man. Once I'd done so many trips on this ship, I had leave, paid leave, holiday pay, if you like. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm getting paid. I'm on leave. I've got three weeks off before I have to go down and sign on another ship. And the old fella's like, get a job. Still. I'm like, <laughs> I've got a job. I'm on holiday. I don't get it. And here's what really could put the car amongst the pigeons. It was a Sunday morning. And it was the same old room first. Get up, get up, get up to church, church. I'll have my mum trying to get five kids right now because I'm still in bed. You know, fighting over breakfast, this, that. He's, he's got the air, but he's got the air driver. The old fella, news of the world, cigar. So she comes in my room. Right, come on, you're going to go to Smith's church. I'm not going. What? I'm not going, Mum. I'm not going anymore. That's that. And how old are we now? 18? Now, I'm 17. 17. <clears throat> yeah. I'm 17. I say, I'm not going. And she goes like, Tommy, the old fella. Well, he's not going to church. So he gets to a part of bed. He's there in his pyjamas. I'm there laying in bed and he's like, you get up and go to church. I said, I'm not going. I said, you know, as long as you go in this house, you'll obey my rules. I, I can get a ship, I can leave. I don't, you, you can't do that anymore. I said, anyway, you don't go. He says, I do go. I go in the evening. I said, well, I'll come this evening with you. <coughs> with you, I'll come this evening. Sorry, he, I've got to get some water. <laughs> <laughs> you all right, mate? You know what happened there? What? It was... <laughs> It was the laughter and the salami went down the wrong right, way. Right, right. Um, and your storytelling. <laughs> so he, you said, "Go on, I'll come the <coughs> evening with you." Yeah, I go in the evening. Well, I'll come this evening with you. And he looked at me and he went, "Leave him alone, Bridget." <laughs> 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 and he went back to bed with his news of the world. My mum heaved a sigh and just hustled out the other five. Now they're all going. How come he doesn't have to go? How come so the descent started in the ranks? So I stayed in bed anyway. I had a sig while I was in bed. And uh, that was that. I never went again. This week's episode is sponsored by Zifferblatt. What's, what's, Craig, what are you talking about? What is Zifferblatt? I'm going to tell you. You probably haven't heard of it, have you? It's a pay-per-minute sitting room, and you pay eight pence per minute, and everything else is free. Trust me. You go in there, you've got tea, coffee, cake, breakfast, brownies, toasties, cookies, Wi-Fi, they've got loads of other snacks. 
There's couches there, there's board games. And what well, look, what it is, it's an alternative to a co-working space or a cafe. So if you've got meetings, you've got work to do, just go there. And the great thing is they've got a cap. If you're there for four hours, you don't pay anything else. You could stay there all day if you want. Trust me, I have done. And also, if you're a student, you get 25% off with your valid student card. Another little tasty treat if you're a Two Shot Pod listener and you quote Ziffer, Z-I-F-E-R, Two Shot, and then the numbers 241. That's Ziffer, Two Shot, 241. It's buy one, get one free. You go, bring your mate for free. Try it out today. That discount is valid till the end of March. A huge thank you to Zifferblatt. And if you're in Manchester, Edge Street in the Northern Quarter, pop there. If you're in Media City, it's at the Tomorrow Building, go there. If you're in Liverpool, St Paul's Square, get yourself over. Use Zifferblatt. Sponsors of this week's Two Shot Podcast. Cheers, guys. What was your relationship like with your brothers and sisters? Great, I've gotten great with me uh, brothers and sisters. I had two, two sets of twins in our family. I had an older brother and sister. I think they're about eighteen months older than me, John and Liz. Um, oh yeah, please, please, Griff. Tea bag left in, mate. <laughs> uh, then there was me. Uh, producer Griff going on a, a two shot podcast tea run. Thank you. Anyone else? Want? No, we're grand, mate. Two sugars. Cheers. Um, yeah, then there was me. Then there was my two twin sisters. Yeah. Trees and Phil. Phil's not with us any longer, bless her. Uh, and then my younger brother, Tom, who's also no longer with us. So, you know, it was quite six of us. It was chaos, but it was a, it was a happy... I got on great with my sisters. I looked after them. I was always like... Um, with the oldest, Steve? You're the oldest? I'm not the oldest, no. no. I've got a brother and sister. Brother and sister, they're the oldest. Brother and sister's yeah. the oldest, then me, then two sisters, then Tom. Um, yeah, we had our little sibling ri- rivalry, but no, I-, I looked after my sisters, they looked after me, we watched each other's backs. We all got on well like that. Um, we did all right, my mum and dad did all right, they were crafters and they, they did instill some kind of moral thing on it. It was a bit far too religious for me. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, uh, it didn't really do me any harm. It made me make my mind up a few things. Yeah, of course. <coughs> so, um... And do you think your dad was trying to install a work, e- a work ethic in you? Very much so, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, he, he was proper old school. If you didn't work, you know, you weren't a real person. Um, yeah. I, I understand the work ethic he was, he was putting into me, but he couldn't seem to get his head around the fact that not everybody works Monday to Friday, nine to five. And again, I'd come home from sea and I'd be on leave, paid leave. And I always sent me my money while I was away. That went straight into uh, uh, her bank account or whatever. So I was paying me keep while I wasn't there. Yeah. But yet when I came home, it seemed to annoy him. The fact that I could lie in bed when I was on holiday. I was on holiday and he couldn't get, seem to get his head round that. Probably things for him hadn't <coughs> shifted. He was still the father and you were still the child. Very much And so. even what he said, you know, you're under my roof, you do yeah. as I say, you yeah. go out and get a job it and was things like that. very much yeah. that, the pecking order, because my older brother, John, that's when they started fighting. Well, be- before that, is before one of the things that made me go to sea, my older brother was starting to assert himself. He did have a job. He was working, he was paying his... What was John doing? He was <coughs> he was working in um, spraying cars at a car shop, body body shop and all yeah. that. He got an apprenticeship doing that. I don't know if apprenticeship's the right word, but that's what he was doing. And yet the old fella seemed to resent it when he went out on Friday with his mates. My brother was earning now, he was just a bloke. And the old fella always used to lock the door at half ten at night and then my brother would come and he'd be banging it down and then there'd be fights. Sometimes the police got called. And, you know, they'd come to fisticuffs. fisticuffs. Very much so. They'd come to fisticuffs and a dog would get a kick off someone and the girls would be crying, my mum would be crying, I didn't know what to do. They'd fight each other. Sometimes pretty violent stuff. Um... And once or twice the police did get called. 
I remember thinking then, I'm not going through this. Yeah. I remember thinking that. It was one of the catalysts. And, of course, when I did come home, and I, I just went out, that bit had been diffused now. My old fella had grown to accept that, yeah, these lads grow up and these girls grow up. And I think he, a part of him hated that. You know, instead of encouraging it and taking you out for a pint. I think I only ever bought my old fella a pint once in a pub when I saw him in a pub. And he, he died in 80, uh, 87, 88, sorry. I never really went out for a drink with him and I missed that. I wish I could have done that. But I don't think... To him, it was like a, he didn't have the power anymore and I, I hated it that he saw it that way. It's funny, isn't it? Do you think he... <clears throat> and I don't know, do you think maybe you would never have had that that equal relationship anyway? There always would have been the father and son relationship where... Yeah, I seem to think that's how how it was when he was brought up. Mm. I but think that's a generation thing, yeah, though, isn't it? but sometimes you've got to grab these things by the scruff of the neck and say, no, just because that's been happening there... Yeah. ..does not mean it's happening here. No, because we're the ones that have... The, or, you know, whoever, w- one has the power to change that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, only us can change mm. that. And I, I did hate those fights, and they become such a regular thing. It was every Friday and Saturday. You could set your watch by it. Did your dad... Because your dad obviously was was a grafter and he worked hard. Did he never, you know, of a Friday or a Saturday, go to the pub with his mates or anything like that? He used to go to... The, what he used to do. i never seen him... <coughs> i never ever seen him getting ready and somebody called for him to go out for a drink. What he used to do was when he'd done his work, he'd go to the pub on the way home. So he don't have his... I don't know where he went. I don't right. know who he spoke to. I don't really know who his mates were. They, they never really came out of the house. So he, he'd finish work and then he'd go to a pub. And sometimes my mum used to hate that because he'd come in. Sometimes when he was drunk, he would be very grumpy and look for things to argue about. And that didn't help matters. I mean, he was a good bloke, don't get me wrong, and he put food on the table and all that. But when he came in in a bad mood, everybody had to jump and play ball. And the slightest thing could have set him off sometimes. He could come in and there might be, I don't know, somebody's coat might be thrown on the chair. What's that doing there? Hang it up. And then if he came in the back where the kitchen was and all that, where our record player was and the radio where we used to kind of congregate. This is how, that's too loud, turn it down. Yeah. He always yeah. seemed to be asserting his authority, sometimes over nothing, in my opinion. Um, but that was him. And did your, did your dad and your John always have that sort of fractious relationship? Yeah. Or... Well, only when John got older, and I never really understood it because John was the first born even though he's a twin, he, he was the first born. And he had... It was touch and go with him for a bit when he was a kid. He had something wrong with his brain or something in his head. I still can't get the details off my mum. But it, it was like touch and go for a bit with him. And I, and I always thought that, if anything, that would have made me dad more... You know, look, lucky to have him. Or yeah, of course. To not be confrontational with mm. him. <clears throat> to understand that this young... Oh, nice one, cheers. <clears throat> that this young baby is now a man. He's working for a living and he's out and he's enjoying himself and he's got his own life and he's... But my old man never seemed to get that. And it always amazed me. It's funny when <clears throat> another male arrives in, in the, the alpha male's cave. Very much so, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? That's why I think I got... I s- skirted all that by going away. And I, I, I always say, I'd never hit me dad, I'd never. Because they used to come to some severe blows. And I thought, I could never do that. And my escape, and my channel, and that anger that I had sometimes is, I'd just go and get a ship. I'd just go. And that was in the days where you could go down to the shipping federation then. While we were on leave, they paid us our wage, and they topped it up. Um... But you go in the, in the shipping federation, it's like signing on, but we all worked on the ships. Yeah. And it'd be a board up, a whiteboard like that, and it'd say the name of the ship. 
what they needed, you know, a deckhand or a catering or a cook, a chef, an AB, an able seaman. I was working up to being an able seaman now. Uh, and it'd have where it was going and how long it was going for. And I went in there one day, this was like after seven times going to Montreal and freezing. And say, once, once, oh, water froze up in me well, is that's another story. But I went, <laughs> I went in uh, the shipping, for, no, we were in, in Montreal and the, the guy said, we're in port. And he said, right, we're taking fresh water on. You stand out near the pipe, coming from the fresh water pipe, up into this metal baffle, into the water tanks, and the hose fitted it, and there was water pumping through. My job was to stand there. When it started overflowing, i.e. the tank was full, give him a wave, and he'd turn off the water, and it'd stop. That was the plan. And I stood there, and it's like 25 below zero, and I just stood there, and this water's going in. And it starts coming out, because it's overflowing now. So I waved to old Tommy, and he turns off his standpipe, but of course the water's still coming up the pipe and it's still overflowing out. And by the time Tommy walks back to the ship, right, come on, lad, let's get a brew. I go like that and I can't move <laughs> because the water's not only gone down inside my wellies, it's not like one of those slush puppies inside my wellies, <laughs> but it's frozen around my welly boots, so I can't. I, I literally can't lift my legs up because it's frozen in ice. That's how quick these things used to freeze. So he's like, oh, wait, I can't, Tommy, I'm stuck. Oh, you daft bastard. And then he had to get an hammer and chisel and just <laughs> chip out the ice. And I, I remember just trying to walk in, feeling, you know, just blue with the cold and all this slushy ice down my wellies. Just straight off and then just let the radiator get him warm and like, you know, not going out again now for hours. But anyway, I get back to the shipping federation. I look on the board, wanted... A, B, uh, not A, B, E, D, H, that's me, fishing deckhand by now. Yeah, get a UK, dear. Going to India. Maybe six months. I was like, there's 20 people in front of me. I'm like, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want hate, that. Hate, I want that, I want that. <laughs> and I got there and I went, I want that ship. <laughs> and he went, right, <laughs> go and sign on, it's in the docks now. So I went and signed on to that, signed the article, so I now work for that ship. Uh, we sail in like three days or something, first round the British coast. I thought, I'm on it, I'm on it. And that was great. But I mean... And was it six months? It, I stayed on it longer, it was about six months. First it sailed around the British coast, we went to Swansea or Cardiff, can never remember. Uh, somewhere in Scotland, I think it was uh, Greenock. And then it went back to Manchester, and then it went what we call deep sea. It went right across and it went uh, through the Med, through the Red Sea. We went to Saudi Arabia, we went to Yemen, <laughs> we went to Pakistan, and we went to India. And we stayed in these ports a long time. And then it came all the way back and then it done around the coast again. I was on it a good year. Well, yeah. Yeah. So um, how old are you now? I'm 18 now. 18? Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I was going to say, you must be like 24 now. No, so I'm much 18 now. <laughs> well, I had my 18th birthday in <laughs> Mumbai, as it is now. But that was uh, Bombay then. Bombay at the time, yeah. Yeah. It's lovely, isn't it? it yeah, it's I lovely. Love it but I found this place, um, a right den of iniquity. It was fantastic. But because you're only allowed... <laughs> <laughs> You were allowed like two beers a day on that ship. And for some of the old uh, piss heads, they, believe it or not, I didn't drink a lot. I did when I was ashore, but I wasn't one of them who, well, I did sometimes, but needed a drink on the ship. Well, some of the old fellas, they told me, well, you give me your beer. And you'd give them because they had the shakes and the DTs and all that nonsense. So anyway, while we were at port in Mumbai, Bombay, they told me to go ashore and get them some beer. So you give me about 100 quid in rupees, is a lot of money. Anyway, I didn't get the beer. I absconded to this place, this is a house of ill repute, that I'd already been to. <laughs> <laughs> and I basically moved in there for three days. Uh, I didn't come out. I had my 18th birthday there. The women were great. They, they didn't have Rizzlers. They, made, they could make you joints out of cigarettes. And they had it fine out. They'd just empty all the backy out, make you a bit of black and then bang it back in, bang. Next thing you had ten joints. 
And I spent all the money in there. So they fed me, oh, they were great. They fed me, they watered me, they scored uh, joints for me. They looked after me in other ways. I was 18 and nobody knew me mum. <laughs> and then... Um, There's no spies in Bombay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was like, this is great. And then the madam, oh, she was awful. She said, right, you've got no more money left, fuck off. <laughs> so it's like, ah. Oh. Anyway, I got back to the ship. You must have been like, for the eye jump. Oh, wait till they see you, wait till they see you. But first port call was the skipper, who I'd been missing for three days. So I had to go in and see the captain. And it was like, you know, I've been worried about you, I'd search parties out, nobody knew where you were, you did the, the, getting all that bollocks. So I, I, I took it, I took the bollocks, and he... He did, he finally, tell him, did he tell him what the the truth? No, no. I just told him. I just said I was with someone. Uh, he just bollocked me basically, and he fined me a day's pay um, and something else besides. And I stood there shuffling my shoes and looking down like I was at school again, getting bollocked. And then he said, "Anything to say for yourself?" And I said, "I'm sorry, it, it won't happen again." Any chance of a sub? <laughs> and he went, uh, <laughs> "How much do you want?" I'm hundred quid. Yeah. So he gave me 100 quid and I fucked off back there. No, you didn't. <laughs> I did. I went straight back there. <laughs> it won't happen again. <laughs> I, went, I went straight back there. And I knocked on the, the, the man and, yeah, I've got money. Come in. So I only stayed about a day and a half this time. Because <laughs> I thought, I can't stay here forever and I know we're sailing soon and I've got to face the music. So I owed them money. And they were not happy with me. Anyway, I got, got back again after being there a day and a half, two days, and I had to see the skipper again. And I told him some cock and bull story that I'd met this girl and fell in love and all that. He bollocked me again. He was a bit soft touch, really. And you he, obviously knew it was a soft touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because he, he gave me the hundred quid. Yeah, of he, was, he was one of the most. I can't indecisive. believe he gave you that hundred quid after three quid. days going missing. I know, I know. <laughs> but then I got, when I come out of there, it was like, you cruise bar now so I went and it was like a kangaroo court and I shit myself and it was like right you owe us money yeah yeah no I'll, I'll, I'll pay everyone and basically they all said we want our money back and I went, you, you, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you your money back and then he basically all said anyway well done lad we did done the fucking same <laughs> now fuck off <laughs> and that was it that was it. Oh, my God. I thought they'd give me a good kicking, at least. But to, to a man, every one of them were like, good on you, lad. I'd have done the same. That's the kind of mentality it was. That's, that's one of the best 18th birthday stories I've ever heard. It was, it it was great. It was a great 18th. So, how long did you stay on there for? And when did you decide to go? Right, I ended up getting kicked off. What for? Uh, I jumped ship in Japan. I went missing twice in Japan. Um, and I had a, a violent uh, altercation with someone. What, anyway, happened? what happened? Can you talk about that? Um, I can and I can't. But basically, I wouldn't allow myself to be bullied. There was this guy, this was on the... On the ship? Yeah, yeah. on the ship. He was Australian. Uh, he was a strange bloke. He was a big fella. Anyway, cut a long story short, he tried it on with me once. And I let him know that I wasn't interested. He was a big bloke, and another fella heard the uproar, shall we say, came in and investigated. That was that. So I knew I had to do something drastic here to put this in order with the Australian, because he was, he kept he was letting me know he was the alpha male, and well, he was. Yeah. He was six foot odd, he was a big bloke, I'm a skinny little shit. So what I did was a bit out of order, but I knew how to do it. I waited till he was in the, there was communal toilets on that ship. He was in the shower. I saw him pa walk past my cabin, got in the shower. <coughs> I waited. When he was in the shower, washing his hair, I pulled the curtain aside, I kicked him in the bollocks, with me steel toe cap work boots on. And when he went down, I gave him a few digs, and I said to him, if he ever comes near me again, I'll put an hammer through his head while he's asleep. Not that I would, 
What I, what I wanted him to do was think I had the mentality to do that. Yeah. And they believed me. Because if you weren't a match for him <clears throat> physically... I couldn't, I couldn't physically. No. You know, only this, me and you outside now, it just pummeled me. Mm. So I knew that. So I had to let him know that I was a sneaky little shit who'd resort to anything in order to get my way, if you like. Because sometimes they're the scariest. So, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, that worked. And I had no problem with him again. And again, when word got round, the, the lads were like, fair enough. But it was a combination of things. The behaviour was getting a bit more erratic ashore. I did go missing twice in Japan. I had to go to um, some place in Liverpool to explain all this. The incident in the shower, the going ashore. Why did the Australian reporter? Yeah, he reported it and people weren't happy about that. But um, I decided not to go to it. So basically, I, I kind of just resigned my post, if you like. Right. Because I didn't think I could, I didn't think I would have come out of it well if it had gone to this uh, tribunal no. or yeah, whatever. Yeah, of course. Because um, sometimes you can be too direct and it can be detrimental to yourself. That's true. So that was that, you know. <laughs> then I got a job delivering industrial pipes. I got married. Uh, I think I got married in 1981, 82, <coughs> something like that to Julie. Got married, worked at this place called BSS, delivering uh, industrial pipes. I knew something wasn't right. I was one upper. All right. Was it being back on land, do you think, after all it, that time? Or it, it was, there must have been a, a, a... Being away for so long and on the ship and in that... In that mentality and with that crew and all those lads mm. must be very different coming back. Yeah, yeah, it was. it was. It was, again, it was back into a different world. The only saving grace about this job is, in my mind, I was out in a van all day. I was moving around. On your own? Yeah, on right. my own, delivering right. these industrial pipes. On a little Sherpa van, but um, it, it, was, it wasn't the same, obviously, but I wasn't stuck in one place all day. I used to get the orders and go and deliver them and all that and do that and do my day's work. Um, I wasn't happy about it, but to me, I had some kind of little bit of a freedom of movement. That's how I justified it anyway. Yeah. But again, I always knew there's got to be something more. This is not what I want to do. This is not, I am not into working to earn money to buy stuff I don't need or want in order to work to buy stuff I don't need or want. <laughs> it was the like, circle. Yeah, yeah, the old vicious catch-22 of like, why am I doing this shit job? To pay for that stuff that you don't need. Why have I got this stuff I don't need? Because that's the rewards of having this job. Or because society says, oh, well, I should yes, have a job. Or because yes. my dad says I should have a yes, job. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, what trainers are you wearing, mate? Who cares? My feet are dry. You know, well, all them trainers are... What? They're better trainers to me. Yeah. It, not, but that's the kind of thing people's mentality was at. It wasn't for me. So did you, you obviously felt that something was missing or something you weren't on very, the right very, path? very, very much missing. I wasn't on the right path. And I knew it and I wasn't happy about it. And we ended up, I ended up getting laid off in that job because I think I did it myself. I think I, I, I just wanted, I wanted to get out of there. I got asked to leave, basically. I don't remember doing anything wrong or anything like that. I just think I got a bit slapdash about it, a bit haphazard, because yeah. my heart wasn't in it. Yeah. And then me and, me and Julie, my, my first wife, ended up getting divorced. <coughs> So, then it was like I was on the dole. Now, this would be 1980, 84, 85. I think it was about 85. Anyway, I was on the dole. How old are you now, Steve? Um, 26. Right. Yeah, 26. Yeah, I was at the pipe thing for a few years. I think five years. And I know I'm not right. I'm still living in a flat. Me and my wife are renting this flat in Crumsall. Moved up to Crumsall. Um, yeah, going to work, she worked, I worked, she worked, I worked. We're smoking a bit of pot, this, that and the other. Then I kind of got laid off from BSS. And I was on the dole, so I smoked a bit more pot. 
But then I went to Abram Moss and he did a foundation course and one of the subjects was drama. And as soon as I seen that, I knew I wanted to do it. However, to do that drama, you had to do three other subjects. One was English. Uh, I think one was maths. It might have been maths. There was two you had to do. Yeah. And the other two were your choices. So, yeah, I'd done the English. Yeah, I'd done the maths or whatever it was. I think history. But I wanted to just do the drama. I did the drama great. I was actually learning something. It was only a basic foundation course. Where was this foundation course? Where was it? At Abram Moss Centre in uh, Manchester. Oh, it's in... Mar- it's in Crumsall, yeah. Right, is it still there now? Yeah, it's is still it? there. I don't know if they still do them <clears throat> courses. I think it's changed a bit, but... It was Abram Moss Centre, you know, it was like a leisure centre, swimming pool, library, uh, a lot of students there, all sorts of different subjects. But they did this drama thing, and it was, like, great. So I joined that, and I, and I was in this sort of drama group, and it was great, but the, <clears throat> the other lessons were... I didn't like them. Now, I wasn't paying attention in them. No. And I just wanted to do the drama. Yeah. And yet it was only a quarter of the course. Of course. So I packed it in. Did you? I got a taste for it. After how long? Not long, I think. I didn't think I a saw term? a year out. Yeah, maybe a term. Maybe a term. And I did love it, but I kept getting in trouble for not going to the... Other classes. English like yeah. class or the maths class, and I didn't want to do it. So anyway, I left... But the drama teacher there, Helen Parrott, bless you, Helen, if you're listening. I was living in, in Crumsall then. Helen Parrott came... Now, I'd, I'd left Abram Moss. I was working on the side. I was signing on. I was working on the side for this guy, stripping out warehouses for things. But I came home one day, and Helen Parrott came to my house. And she said to me, listen, you're starting a new course at Abram Moss called uh, a practical drama course. She said, this would be right up your street. No maths, no English. No, like solidly focusing. Solidly drama. But if you get accepted on it, you'll be part of a group with the other students. You'll have a budget. And it's up to you. You have to devise, perform and tour three productions in a year. One for children, one for teenagers, one for old people. And that, to me, was like, yes. I went, where do I sign? God, we're going, <coughs> we're going right back to the bank robber sketch. Yes. In, in a way. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. We, we have. Yeah. So, so I couldn't thank Helen Parry enough. How incredible that she, she, she had the, that. The, 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 being so thoughtful to come round your house. You wouldn't have, might not have known about it otherwise. I wouldn't have known about it. I wouldn't have known anything about it. But Helen saw something in me, because... Um, she just did. And I, I, I can't thank her enough for that because I, I was straight back down there. I want to sign on for this. I got accepted onto it. And it was brilliant. We had a van, we had a trailer, and we had a, ba- a blackboard. It was like, right, kids, what do we do? We need this, we need that, we need that. We had our own costumes, we made costumes, we'd written scripts, we devised stuff, we improvised stuff. You know, we threw things out that didn't work. We came together as a group, um, and it was really, really quite fulfilling. You know, throwing all these flats, these flats on the on this trailer that we had, that were painted by us, wearing costumes by us. And you, you had complete control over everything, didn't we you? We did, we did, and it was one of the best things ever. I couldn't get enough of it. I had, I had holes in my jeans. I had no money for clothes. Like I remember Dave Mutra. He runs Corner House now, Dave. I remember him saying to me, saying to the class one day, look at him, he's got his ass hanging out of his pants. He jumps the train to get here. He used to jump the train because he didn't have ticket money. Yeah. But that drama course was, was saved my life because, again, we devised and we wrote, we performed everything and we did it with gusto because we enjoyed it. And you were learning. We were learning, never stopped learning. As I say, we did the, uh, we went around infant schools, doing uh, the place for little kids. And then it was the uh, teenagers at secondary school who'd seen it all. And then it was the old people in homes who probably seen it all, but forgot they'd seen it. So we had all ends of the scale. And it was just, just beautiful to 
make things suitable for that, yeah. you know. Especially for them little ones. Yeah. They're, they're that's, a, that's a hard audience. <laughs> <laughs> they, can, they can spot a, spot a bullshitter a mile Indeed off. Indeed they can. Um, so what, how, long, how long have we done that for? <coughs> done that for a year. Yeah. <coughs> Sue Cleaver was in it, uh, plays Eileen, now in Curry. Of course. Sue was right. one of the group in that. Um, and it was great. And then we all went up to Billingham and we performed at the Billingham Inter- International Folk Festival on behalf of Abram Moss. And we got friendly with the Peking Opera. They were there, man. They, they were fantastic acrobats. And we were doing these kids. We were in between um, the crowds doing entertaining the kids there, if you like. And you see the Peking Opera doing these mad acrobatic things. But we got so friendly with them. Uh, and, and everybody else up there, great time. And that, that to me stood me in good stead. Next thing was, how do we get an equity card? Because you needed one then. So I left Abram Moss, <coughs> I got divorced, and then it was like, right, we need an equity card because now we want to be on telly. <coughs> so the first thing was, extra work, big mistake. <coughs> anyway, how do we get contracts? You need to be in a variety act. Me and this lad and this girl worked, we called ourselves the Snackheads after some out of 2018. But we were basically doing street theatre. Yeah. Uh, Life and Times of Piggy Person, historical, stupid street theatre. <laughs> busking, we were busking. Yeah. We did that. Can we get an equity contract? No, it's not variety. So I joined up with two musicians, one who's my younger brother, Tom. <clears throat> and we, we made a 45 minute musical show. It was actually called the 45 minute musical extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sketches, but with music. And we all chopped around and changed. And, uh, you know, we had a game show in there. It was a piss-take thing. But we had, actually had a game show in it. This is 1980... Oh, my, my, 87. No, I got stabbed before that. There was a heavy stabbing. Oh, OK. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Put the brakes on. Right, Let's okay. go back to this. What happened? What, with the stabbing? Yeah. OK, with the stabbing, that, that was 1987. So I've been Abram Moss. That's right, we were trying to get our equity cards. So we were, I was working with these uh, the musician, but we were doing a bit of sketches at um, this wine bar called Hamilton's in Presswich as well. Me and my mate used to do a sketch every week. Anyway, <laughs> every Monday. So one, month, one Sunday night, it was Mother's Day actually, Mother's Day, 1987, never forget it. I went down to Salford with my girlfriend, the mother of my two girls now. Uh, anyway, went down to Salford, my mum, Mother's Day, took my mum to this pub, had a drink with her. My mum went home, me and my girlfriend stayed. I ended up getting stabbed through the liver, the lung and the diaphragm and getting my throat cut and ended up on a life support machine. <laughs> how, how, did, how did that come about? I'll tell you. We were in the pub. But, uh, I'm not going to say the pub. We were in the pub anyway. No, we can always cut it out, mate. Don't worry. We were in the pub. My mum, me, and my girlfriend. My mum went because she didn't live far away. We were in like this small box room. It was opening. It had a, a rail, not a balcony. It was like the other room was maybe a foot lower. We were there. There was a, these lads in, probably about eight or ten of them on the corridor where you exit. My girlfriend went to the toilet. Apparently, one of them grabbed her yeah. on the way back. She told me, and I thought, what do we do about this? I remember, I'm in this enclosed space. There's another girl and a bloke sat here, minding their own business. One of these lads just comes on this lad's blind side, just smacks him in the face. No reason, no build-up. Not even, who are you looking at, mate? Totally blindsided and knocked a poor guy off his chair. And they all had a good laugh about it. The lad's girlfriend picked a bloke up and said to her, said to her boyfriend, are you going to let him get away with that? And one of these other guys ran out, broke free, grabbed her by her throat and launched, launched her over the table. And oh, said, no. do you want a bottle over your head? You cunt, something like oh. that. So I thought, we need to get out of here. Yeah. <clears throat> the only way I can get out 
apart from jumping the balcony, which my girlfriend can't do, is to get through these lads and they bunched just a thin corridor. So my girlfriend goes first. And as I get level with one of them, his eyes locked, and I said something, and I shouldn't have. Anyway, I said, uh, nice, isn't it, when you can grab women when there's about ten of you? I know, I know, oh. mate, I know. I know. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have. But anyway, what happened then was he glassed me in the face, which I thought I'd lost my eye, to be honest. He glassed me in the face and then cut me throat with the back swing of it here. And I know a lot of blood came out. Then we started fighting. Do you know what I mean? It's really in close face, space. Anyway, I go down to the floor and I'm getting a real good kicking, proper kicking of about eight guys. And I can't see out of my left eye. I'm actually on all fours, feeling around for my eyeball, believe it oh. or not. Because you, you uh, obviously thought it had come out. I thought it had come out. Yeah. And I remember seeing my girlfriend's legs disappear through the crowd. I remember thinking, oh, fuck that, I'll get a glass eye. It's funny how your brain works. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that, I'll get a glass one. And I crawled, I crawled out, still getting a kicking. Out of this door, my girlfriend said, come on, Steve, come on. So we come out of there, we come up the steps. I've got a white shirt on, I'm covered in blood. I don't know I've been stabbed. All I know is I've lost my eye, which I haven't. And I've had a good kicking, but adrenaline. Uh, I'm walking, girlfriend's in front of me getting to my mum's, which is not far away. We get to my mum, she bangs on the door, Steve's been attacked, Steve's been attacked, oh my God, blood everywhere. Um, I get in, they ring an ambulance, I'm upstairs in the bathroom with my dad, my throat's wide open here, you just miss a juggler, there's only a white, small white mark here, but that was quite wide. And um, I've got my head over the sink, and my dad's bathing my neck, and there's blood running down the sink, and he's, what happened now? But it's at that point, I couldn't breathe then. Right. Now I knew something was seriously wrong. And I opened my shirt, because I could feel his pain here now at my side, <laughs> kicking in. And I looked, and there was just blood, more or less gushing out of my yeah. side. <clears throat> anyway, the ambulance came, and I get rushed into the ambulance. I've got my eye, they pop it out, give it a polish. There's a bit of glass in it or something, so I couldn't see. My brother's in the ambulance with me. Me and my mate have got a gig at Hamilton's the next day. One of the things I need is the theme tune of The Twilight Zone, which is on that night, Sunday night. So you can tell him to tape it. So I'm in the ambulance. <laughs> I'm in the ambulance like this, with my throat wide open. My mum's, my mum and our kids in the ambulance. And we're getting rushed, like old blues and twos on. This is this Tom's in the ambulance This is Tom's yeah. in the ambulance with me. And I'm like, Tom, so you're all right, kid. Tom, whatever you do tonight, make sure you tape the Twilight Zone music <laughs> for the gig tomorrow. And he went, you won't be gigging tomorrow. And next thing, I'm in the hospital, yeah. They've popped the eye out. They're sewing the neck up. And now I'm in a lot, a lot of pain. Mm. And I'm just kind of begging to be knocked out. So anyway, I get knocked out. I come to, <clears throat> and I'm paralysed from my neck down, which they've done for my own safety. I've got um, a tube up every orifice, plus two bags of blood hanging from my side to regulate my blood flow because I'd lost so much blood. <clears throat> I think they put 30... 32 units through me or something. It was a lot. I was in surgery or theatre, not the kind of theatre you want to be in, <laughs> for about 18 hours. Bloody hell. And I've got this industrial pipe from a lung machine or whatever it is that's helping me breathe. So it's basically... <sighs> I can't move. All I can do is open my eyes. And there's a bloody priest there. There's a fucking Catholic priest there. I swear to you, I swear he was hovering. He was just like waiting. Have you got anything to confess? What? First of all, I can't speak because I've got a tube in my mouth. 
I'm on, I'm on about a vacuum cleaner tube yeah. this big right down your throat. <coughs> Secondly, it's none of your business. And thirdly, why are you here? <laughs> My mum, oh, he's a Catholic. So, um, well, that was it. That was kind of like a low ebb. Because then the next day, and they took this thing out, and they said to me, we're going to have to operate again because you burst a blood vessel internally and it's not right. So I had to go back into the theatre and they had to do it again. And then they, when they eventually sent me home, um, I was on a walking stick. I was like seven stone. How, how long were you in hospital for? Uh, well, I had, ended up having six major operations over that. I think the first time I was in hospital for maybe three weeks or something. I don't know. I was on morphine at the time. They had a tap of morphine straight into my neck. But um, when I did get sent home, I had this excruciating pain one day. I was living in, in Presswich now, and I had to get back to the hospital, and it was what they call post-operative adhesion, is loose skin forms in your stomach, and all the loose skin from the two operations had basically formed a ball and blocked my intestine. So I had to go in and I had to operate and they had to remove that, which they did. Then later on, my stomach swelled out. This was months later. It swelled out really bad. And I went back in hospital and the knife was infected. It's actually a paint scraper file down that I used to knife me with. It was infected, so I had an infection in my stomach. And I went there and he said, do you mind if students come in? And I said, no, that's fine. And he basically lay me on this bed and he did put like five cuts with a scalpel on my stomach and squeezed it. And all this green, like, it's like Play Doh. This, all these students pressed on my stomach and this green fudge came out. And as soon as I smelled it, I just got sick. It was like not a good time to be alive. I'm laying there with like green fudge coming out of my stomach with my own puke all over me because I'm gagging because of the smell. And then this nurse. Five holes they cut in me, packs each hole with this white ribbon <coughs> to soak up the infection. So I spend <coughs> the next month and a half, two months at home and this nurse comes round every day and she pulls out the old stuff, which is all infected, and she packs in the new stuff. And that went on for months and months and months and months until the infection cleared up and the holes got sealed and that was it. And then just what I thought of it, it Took a piece of rib out. <coughs> that was another operation because it was infected. So then when I thought everything was all right, and I was back on my feet again, it starts swelling up again. Same thing happens. Not as bad. I have to go back in hospital. Now they do another operation for another piece of rib that's infected. That clears up. Six months later, it swells out again. I'm working in a bar at night now. Um, and... Basically, I said, why do you keep taking bits of ribs? I'll just take the whole fucking thing out. They were chasing the infection. <coughs> so I made sure that they took more, and that was the last time, touch wood. So it was like six major operations for that. Crikey. So then it was like, now we'll get an equity card. So well, what, you, 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 you're, you're better now. Your mindset was back to this. Yeah, it's right. like, get an equity card. So we needed to get equity cards. We did, we'd done this 45 mi mi musical extravaganza with the two musicians, Reno and our Tom, <coughs> me and Colin Pearson, sometimes other people. We had uh, changes of scenery, it was all quite slick, we worked hard on it. There was even a game show in it run by a guy called Stinky Watkins. We were ahead of our time, man. We had a game show in it called Celebrity Who's Turd. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is in, this is in 1988 now. Celebrity Who's Turd we were doing, and it's not far removed from some of the shit that's on today, let me tell you. Um, anyway, then we went down to Equity, which was near the old bus station here in Salford, and we said, uh, we're a variety act, can we have some contracts, thinking he was going to grill us? He went, yeah, there you go. And he gave us a book of contracts. It's like, well, they're empty ones. It was like, and then you needed four past, four present, and four future bookings in order to become a member of equity. So the four past ones, easy, fake them, I'll plug that. Four present ones, can we get four gigs? 
we can get four gigs. We, we were going to pubs, we did one guy who said, look, we don't want paying, just please say you paid us. If you say you paid us, man, we won't even do the gig. <laughs> we won't even do it. <laughs> it was like we were desperate to get these. Anyway, we got these contracts. We fulfilled them. There was always a chance that equity might come to any of the four future ones to see if you're there. That was worrying because we did do some of them, but we weren't getting paid. But anyway, the next thing you know, we got accepted into equity. We got our equity cards. So then it was like, great, we're halfway there. So then we got with this guy doing extra work. <clears throat> and that was another eye opener. And what were you doing extra work on? I'd done extra work, I'd done some on Corre, done some on loads of things, but again, this wasn't right. And me and my mate, we'd done some at Dennis Waterman was in it, don't know what it was. But we were extras in it, we heard it about like cow all day and all that kind of stuff. And we were on set. And this car pulls up, unit car, with some actor in, I don't know who he was. Obviously, his last scene of the production. So, the unit car pulls up. This guy gets out. They have a quick line run. The director says, right, let's go, let's do it. He has his scene with Dennis Waterman. We're in the background being extras, doing what extras do. Nodding our heads, agreeing with each other and pointing. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Never see him disagreeing, do you? <laughs> but anyway... So we're being agreed with each other in the background. And this guy comes, he says his lines. They do another take. Uh, Darius says, right, yeah, cut, I'm happy with that. That's a wrap for Joe Bloggs. Everybody claps him. He's back in the car and he's gone. And I went to my mate, we're doing the wrong thing here. We need to be in that car. We need to be going like that. Uh, and it was that time I decided never to do any extra work again, even though I needed the money. So I didn't, I didn't, and my mate was going, oh, I managed four days of extra work on this. I was going, I'm not doing it. I didn't have a pot to piss in. I remember having to borrow some money to buy a packet of fag papers once, and this guy, I was racing, there's some extra work here, and I was going, I'm not doing it, mate, I'm not doing it. And it's not that it's beneath me, I'm not saying that. It's just a dead end, it's, it's not, not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I want lines, I want lines, I want to be doing stuff. <sighs> Then I joined the Actors Centre in Manchester. It was free to join, I just became a member of it. And the notice board there, there was some interesting stuff on the notice board. Sometimes it was students who were making short films for the thesis or whatever. Are you interested in this? Give me a bang, I was interested in it. Uh, fringe, theatre companies, profit share, never seen anything. But I learnt audition pieces, I learnt a Shakespeare one. That's what I thought you had to do and I learnt a Burkhoff one. I learnt two contrasting pieces. I worked hard on them. I directed them, learnt them, and got my head around what they actually meant. And when I went to some of these fringe things, I started getting audition. I was ringing these numbers, <coughs> saying, come and see me. I'm an actor. Uh, I, I want to be in your theatre company. And I got, I got quite a good hit rate. I've done some really strange little quirky films that students had wrote for yeah. their thing. Don't think I ever got paid, but it wasn't about that. It was about you were training. Yeah. You weren't going to drama school. Exactly. So all this stuff that you were learning. It was it was that was it. The I was learning the craft that way. Yeah. And I was never interested in the money aspect of it. And I'd rather turn down five days extra work that could pay me five hundred quid or whatever and work five days on this student short film that they paid me my bus fare. Because you so, know that you'd be learning something on that that's going to last you for the next five I years. I know, I know. Yeah. And it was tough, Craig. It was like, that's what I did. And I must have worked with every fringe company in Manchester. At the time, 0161 Company, we'd done production of East, of theirs. Stephen Burkhoff's East at the uh, Corner House. I worked with um, some of the theatre company. I can't, loads of them. We, we, we'd done... Man, 94 when Manchester was City of Drama we are at Buxton Festival doing a, uh, a play called The Postcard written by a guy called David Christie which is about the Titanic and unrequited love on that um, and Penny Black Theatre Company I worked loads we'd done a, a, um, a production of Don Juan at the uh, not the contact and Lisa Strata at the contract directed by Noreen Kershaw <coughs> And me and this girl who worked at the Actors Centre, she was a member of it, 
Caroline Woodruff, me and her go back a bit. Me and her, she she got the rights to a play called Elsie and Norms Macbeth. We staged that again. We directed it, produced. Well, she produced it. She put the money up, and we did it at the Actors Centre. I think for three nights. We invited casting directors and the public, and we got quite a good uh, thing. We were saying, "Look, we do exist. Please, casting directors, give us some work. We haven't been to RAD, are we? We're not upper class or middle class. We're just we're here." We're here. So it was that. But how brilliant that you just didn't sit on your arse and moan. No, You didn't. got up and you did something and you learned and you went out and you went, look, we are, we, as you said, we're here, we do exist, this is what we're doing. Yes, this is what we're doing. This is, And then I decided, I looked at the <clears throat> scope of things and think. I thought an actor's cooperative is the way forward. I learned about actor's cooperatives and I joined one of them. But again, for them... To let you join, needed to see you in something. So you had to be doing something. So that's what that came in the Actors Centre. We'd done Elsie and Norms, Macbeth. I think they came to see me in the postcard, some actors uh, co op. We were doing a postcard at Buxton, Fil- Buxton Festival. <coughs> I got accepted into that. I was at Stoke on Trent. I was with them for a bit, but it was all corporate stuff. They were doing a lot of corporate stuff. Then I got with direct personal management in Leeds. Again, through being in something else. I just thought they sounded better, and I got accepted onto that. And I was there when when uh, I ended up doing Looking for Eric. You know, it's been a long, long, hard slog. Yeah. And I've missed out loads of bits. But the thing is, and I, I worked with loads of these job agencies where I always said the same thing to them. I'll do any job you send me for, mate. I'll do any night shift, day shift, I don't care what hours they are. I'll do anything. But I'm an actor, and if I have to have time off for an audition, I have to have time off. Is that fine? No problem, mate. Four times it, no problem, mate. Right, well, put me down for anything you like. Will you work at this carpet place on the night shift? Yeah, of course I will. Will you work there? Yes, of course I will. And then it's like, I'll be there. Foreman, right, I just had a call today for I can't come in tomorrow. <clears throat> I've got an audition. No, 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 mate. No, y- y- you will be in tomorrow. Sorry, mate, no, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, I will not be in tomorrow. I'm going to an audition. Well, if you don't come in tomorrow, then you're not working here again. How's that? Where's my fucking coat? <laughs> and then you go to the audition and you don't get it. So what? I didn't get it. Yeah. If I'd have stayed there, I wouldn't have got it anyway. Exactly. There was one place, I was there 10 minutes. <clears throat> it was packing kitchen stuff. Like you put your plates in when you dry them, the swing bin and the bowl you put in your sink. I got to this place at 7am start. I got there. The guy took me coat. He's a right arsehole. Right, he says, here's what you do. You put them on a pallet. Blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, 10 minutes for your break, 10 o'clock till 10 past 10. Uh, canteen's over there. I so said, where do we go for a smoke? Ah, smoker, eh? Right, OK. Here's what you do with me. Your smoke. You can't, because if you've got a smoke, you have to go right off the premises. It takes you six minutes to walk there. Your break's only ten minutes, so you'll not be smoking. All right. I went, where have you put me coat? He went, your coat's in that room there. So I walked off. He went, where are you going? I went, for me fucking coat. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, are you serious? I went, yeah. He went, right, well, you'll never work here again. I went, but that's pretty much the idea, yeah. I got back in my car, went home. I was going back out the gates at quarter past. <laughs> Wanker. <laughs> Steve. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Thank you. Th- this has just been brilliant. I've got, there's loads more to ask <laughs> and loads more to talk about, but uh, maybe we should probably just do uh, a second part sometime. But to you, honestly, it's been brilliant having you on. <laughs> no, all right. Him. Absolutely brilliant stories. Thanks so much, man. <laughs> I don't think we've talked about acting, really, have we? (laughs) Well, look, you can't say I didn't warn you. I I really try my best with no spoilers. Um, I do remember looking over at producer Griff at one point and he just went, uh, yeah, uh, slightly slightly pale green colour, I think. 
Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure you need to refresh your brew. Um, but I can't thank Steve enough for coming on. It was fantastic. Uh, huge thanks to Ziffer Blatt of Edge Street for sponsoring the episode and helping us out with that space. And what else? I'm not going to waffle too much. It was just a great episode. So look, I'm going to go. I will see you next week for episode 31. Okay? You take care. I've been Craig Parkinson, he's been producer Griff, and this has been the Two Shot Podcast. See you later. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers. Cheers.